We were previously looking at the generic market for loanable funds for private investment. So this was loanable funds that would be used for private investment. There's demand for that investment from individuals who want to move into a new home or from firms that are going to invest in capital and that the supply would be from individuals as well that have excess excess savings that want to lend money. And then we talked about how the price of the real interest rate would really be what kind of clears the market and so as that price increases the supply would increase however the demand would decrease and if that price were to go down the supply would be a little bit lower because individuals who are lending get less in return whereas individuals who would be borrowing money would have a lower price that they have to pay and so they would want to borrow even more money they would want to invest even more in the economy and so we can see those two uh, com competing kind of incentives going at each other within this market and so we would have some sort of equilibrium point as well what I want to do is consider now some shifts that might exist in the market so I'm gonna bring this down here a little bit and give us uh, a little bit of space and we're gonna be looking at three different markets here or considering three different scenarios the first scenario I want to consider would be a policy uh, and we'll kind of mark this over here this would be a policy where uh, let's say the government wants to incentivize in uh, wants to incentivize savings so the government wants to incentivize savings we know that savings leads to investment and so that could be one way that would grow the economy that would increase the amount of capital that's flowing into businesses and and presumably could uh, help with coming up with new technologies or that would make individuals uh, more productive and so we could think about that as a way to potentially grow GDP so maybe the government wants to incentivize savings what would that look like well if we're going to incentivize savings and they could do this in a number of ways I guess I should be a little more clear here they could give tax preference for savings accounts uh, so maybe the interest that you would receive from savings accounts um, would be tax deductible or you wouldn't have to pay taxes on that earned income or on that earned interest uh, you could think about some uh, some ways that this happens like in a like in a Roth IRA account for example where you can save your money what would this look like well this if this is going to incentivize savings we know that the supply of savings here is the supply curve these, these are individuals who are willing to lend money and if we're incentivizing them to lend even more because of tax preference this would be a shift in the supply curve here to the right at any given interest rate real interest rate we would see some sort of increase in the amount that individuals would would be willing to supply on the market for private loanable funds and so we're, this would mark us to supply the second supply curve here marked in yellow and what I want to show is the uh, impact of what that would have we would move from this point right here to this point right here that I've marked in yellow and that's gonna bring us all the way down here we would now be at this level of loanable funds whereas we previously were at this level this increase in loan I'm sorry this increase right here in loanable funds would be good for the economy in that we would incentivize more investment and how would we incentivize that investment well we would go from this equilibrium real interest rate to as a result of the uh, of the policy here the tax preference policy to this new real interest rate and this interest rate would decrease and that makes sense individuals would be better off that's going to push us towards more investment in the economy and even though you would get a lower real interest rate as an individual more people are participating in the market they're adding their savings to the economy because they get tax preference and so we can think about how that would actually help to grow the economy let's say on the second uh, in a second scenario here that maybe the government is going to also do a policy and we'll do that up here they want to do a policy but the policy is going to incentivize excess investment and this could take on a number of ways right this could be a this could be a tax credit for home mortgage deductions to incentivize individuals to go buy a home this could be uh, this could be a depreciation tax uh, incentive so maybe you could write off more of the depreciation of capital investments that you make in uh, in uh, kind of com in, in uh, systems that would be uh, in place or in factories or in um, kind of heavy machinery 
So what would this look like? Well, this is clearly on the investment side, on the demand side here, where we would be incentivizing individuals to make more investments because we are making it cheaper to them, right? This is a way that we would be making it cheaper to the individuals who would be taking out those investments. And so what, and that would be as a result of tax, of a tax policy here. So what would that do? Well, that would be incentivizing, that would be shifting the demand curve to the right. At every given interest rate, we would have individuals or firms that would be wanting to borrow more money at any given interest real interest rate because that because of that tax policy that is going to give them a break on their taxes and so we would see a shift here to this I'll kind of do it as a dotted line here to this second secondary demand curve we would see a shift to the right of the demand curve and that's going to move us right here to this new equilibrium point this policy wouldn't change the supply curve and so now we move up on the interest rates from this point right here up to this point in green right here we would see the interest the real interest rate would be increased as a result of this policy the offset though is that we would get more funds invested into the economy we would go from this amount of loanable funds to this amount of loanable funds on the private market and we would see that increase because the the increase in the real interest rate is being uh, it's being kind of netted out or it's being uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the impact of that for borrowers is being taken uh, taken away as a result of the tax incentive that is in place for them. And so we see this type of thing that happens on the market as well that might increase the real interest rate. However, we see loanable funds that would increase on the market. I want to think about a third model here. And if we're thinking about kind of two different types of tax policies, depending on who it's incentivizing to take action, we can think about a third one down here, which would be persistent government deficits. Persistent government deficits. And we know that when we're talking about uh, kind of, if we think back to, uh, if we think back to national accounting, to kind of national savings and and uh, taking into accounting for national savings, we know that savings is equal to two parts. It is equal to private savings, which is output minus taxes minus consumption. Everything that you have to pay to the government minus everything that you pay privately. This would be private. Uh, con this would be private savings. And then we also want to take into account public savings, which would be the taxes that the government receives minus the spending that the government on expenditures, what they actually spend. And one of the things that we could be looking at here is what if the government has persistent government deficits as a result of increased spending? And so maybe we are spending more on uh, on welfare programs, or maybe we're spending more on uh, on maybe a new war that is going on, like the global war on terror or something of that nature. What is that going to do? Well, that's going to increase this right here. It's going to create more negative in this case, and it's going to decrease public savings. This entire side would become negative, right, or it would become more negative uh, away from a balanced uh, kind of approach. And what would that look like? Well, this would be reducing savings. This would be reducing public savings. And so we would see that is the same here as a shift to the left of the supply curve for savings. And so I'm just going to mark it here where we would look at the supply curve shifting to the left as a result of a decrease in public savings. And we would have this new supply curve here, which would move us to this point. And we can see one of the implica implications of a uh, government, uh, kind of a persistent government deficits where we are spending more than we tax than we take in, which would move us on the total amount of private loanable funds from this point to now this point. We would see this reduction. This is generally kind of the term that we would think about this is it's called crowding out. And crowding out means that private investment would decrease as a result of the fact that the real interest rate is increasing because of government deficits. And so we also see that the government deficits here are creating a real, or I'm sorry, are creating an increase in the real interest rate. 
This is if we're looking at this as a private investment, as the loan, as the market for loanable funds for private investment. You could also come up with a, where a scenario where uh, instead of the government spending more, maybe the spending level stays the same, but taxes fall, which would have a different effect on the economy. But it would be really we'd be looking at the same thing here, where the demand curve would be shifting, but we would get uh, still an increase in the real interest rate. And this is kind of the most important thing here when we're thinking about, uh, in general, what government deficits can do, which is that they can lead to crowding out on the private market as a result of increased real interest rates. Now, I'll say that there is uh, not so, I mean, the theory itself holds up uh, as far as the thinking through of it. However, what we want to think through is that there might be specific reasons for running government deficits. Maybe it's because there's a recession uh, and you need to stimulate demand, or you need to uh, take into account that uh, maybe there is a war or something of that nature that does have some spending that only the government can really spend on. So we're willing to take lower savings at a certain amount of time, even if it might lead to higher real interest rates for a certain amount of time. Uh, for those activities. So there are times outside of this model where government deficits would be needed or would be uh, would be advised. But we do want to think through what the oper or what the um, effect of a kind of persistent government deficits might look like. In the United States, we have been running persistent government deficits for uh, most of the kind of modern economy through the, the latter half of the 20th century and uh, definitely the 21st century as well uh, as a result of war spending and the uh, kind of great recession that happened in 2007 and 2008. We'll spend a little bit more time on that in later videos thinking through what's actually been happening to uh, real government debt over time. But we just want to think through some models of what the government could do to incentivize savings and the result on interest rates, uh, what the government could do to incentivize investment and the result on interest rates and loanable funds for private investment, and what would be one model for analyzing what happens with persistent government deficits.